All right, now back to the schematic where we've established the differences between the neuromuscular junction and the neurons in the central nervous system. We have two final but very complex differences to discuss, which is the fact that the postsynaptic cell receives many inputs, and these inputs are generally weak, such that it takes many excitatory inputs to generate an action potential in the postsynaptic cell. These two statements seem rather simple and encompassing, but it hides a few key aspects that are fundamental to neurons. If we recall the neuromuscular junction, remember that when the motor neuron fired and released acetylcholine on the muscle fiber, it always caused an action potential that then caused the contraction of the muscle. This event is essentially a one-to-one. -one. The motor neuron fires and the muscle contracts, which is rather intuitive and follows how we expect muscles to behave. Hence, the communication between the motor neuron and the muscle fiber is as straightforward as it can be. In the central nervous system, neuronal communication can become highly complex because the weak inputs might not always be sufficient to reach action potential threshold. In any case, neurons must add the inputs they receive to reach that threshold. This aspect is often referred to as summation. As you might remember from our discussions on the action potential, the action potential is most often initiated at the axon initial segment. The reasoning behind why this place is so important in deciding whether the neuron fires or not is because it has the lowest action potential threshold across the neuron. Remember that the definition of the threshold, as defined in our action potential discussion, is the membrane potential at which the inward current, which is mostly carried by sodium, outweighs the outward current from potassium and or chloride. It turns out that the axon hillock is the place which usually has the highest density of voltage-gated sodium channels and thus provides the most inward current to the cell. Another important point to remember is that before the neuron hits the threshold, the signals in the cell are all flowing passively, which means that they decay over time and are not self-sustained like the action potential. For that reason, when the cell adds the inputs together to reach threshold, this summation can be done both in time and space, which introduces us to the concept of temporal and spatial summation. Let's start with temporal summation, which is defined as the summation of two or more consecutive signals. To explain this principle, I want to reconsider the passive membrane properties that I have introduced previously, such that I can better explain some new concepts. If I go too quickly on these concepts in this discussion, I recommend watching the videos on the equivalent circuit model and the RC neuron to get additional insights on these concepts. All right, we've established that there are three fundamental passive membrane properties which govern the temporal and spatial time course of passive propagation. The three properties are the membrane capacitance, the membrane resistance, and the axial resistance. To give a brief description for each, let's start with the membrane capacitance. This property arises by the separation of charges between the membrane. The separation of charge, which can be labeled as delta Q, creates a voltage difference delta V due to the electric field between the charges. This voltage difference is what we know as the membrane potential, and it is related to delta Q by the membrane capacitance constant. Another consequence of charge separation is the fact that when charges enter the neuron, here in this instance positive charges, it causes charges on the opposite side to feel a repulsion and move away. This charge movement creates a current which we've called the capacitive current IC. From delta Q equals CM delta V, we can derive the equation of the capacitive current if we consider the definition of the current, which is simply the derivative of charge over time. Now, the second property is the membrane resistance, which arises from the fact that the membrane has ion channels that let ions flow in and out of the cell. For our temporal summation purposes, there are two distinct types of channels that we need to take into account, leak channels and the ligand-gated synaptic receptors. As we've discussed in the equivalent circuit model video, ion channels obey Ohm's law, and thus, the current that flows through them is equal to the voltage difference divided by the membrane resistance. Another important note about them is that the movement of charges through these channels is powered by the electrochemical gradients of the ions that flow through them. Accordingly, we've derived a modified version of Ohm's law that encompasses all of these different properties. Note that G here stands for the conductance and it represents the inverse of the resistance.
Now, in terms of their roles, leak channels are the channels that are open at rest and govern the resting membrane potential. Their summed resistance or conductance, depending on how you see it, is known as the leak resistance RL. This value is also sometimes referred to as the input resistance. When it comes to synaptic channels, they are the ones that only open during synaptic events. It is very important to keep in mind that their opening changes the total resistance of the cell, but this is a detail I'll come back to shortly. The third and final property is the axial resistance and it corresponds to the internal resistance that charges feel when they move inside the dendrites or axons. The equation that models this property is essentially the same as the equation that models electron flow in electrical wires. Now, to understand temporal summation, we only need the two first properties, membrane capacitance and membrane resistance. Another tool that will be relevant for us to understand how temporal summation occur is to have the equivalent circuit model of the synapse. This circuit basically models the neuron as an RC circuit, which is very convenient for us because from that we will be able to determine equations that will allow us to see how the membrane potential changes as a function of time based on our passive membrane properties. Now, in our system, there are two dynamic states to consider. During the synapse when the synaptic channels open, and after the synapse when the neuron returns to baseline. Let's start with during the synapse. To find the equation of the membrane potential as a function of time, we can establish that the current as a function of time during a synapse will be the sum of the current coming from the capacitor and the resistors. Next, we can substitute the currents for the capacitor and the resistor by their definitions. Here it gets a bit tricky because, as I mentioned a few moments ago, synaptic channels will be active during the synapse and for that reason they will affect the resistance of the system. Based on electric circuit laws, we can find the total sum of the resistances by taking the inverse of the sums of the inverse of each resistance. I will note this new resistance that occurs during the synapse as RSL. With this new resistance, we can now continue the derivation of the equation by multiplying each side by the presynaptic leak resistance. From here, we can define two new quantities, which are the steady state potential and the time constant. You will later see their relevance when we go over them in a bit more detail, but for the moment, they allow us to make the equation less clustered. For those of you who have watched the RC Neuron video, I changed the notation of Vmax to VSS because I feel like VSS, which stands for the steady state, is more telling on what VSS is rather than Vmax. Nevertheless, by substituting these variables, we can rearrange the equation to get this form. The next step in our derivation will actually be to integrate the differential equation we came up with. I will let you go through the steps on your own, but basically we end up getting this exponential equation where the membrane potential as a function of time is equal to the steady state voltage times the exponential factor. This should suffice us for the first state. Now, when the synapse is closed and the membrane potential returns to baseline, the conditions change. First, the current as a function of time now equals zero because the currents are only mediated by the capacitor and the resting resistors which pass current to return to the resting state. But there is no additional source of current now. Another important distinction is that since the synaptic channels are now closed, we only have to take into consideration the resistance of the leak channels, RL. From there, the derivation follows the same steps as before and yields us this equation. You will notice that since the added current in the system is now equal to zero, there is no steady state potential to consider. Instead, since this decay picks up right after the end of the channel's opening, we now have to consider the membrane potential at time zero, but I'll come back to that aspect very shortly. At the end, you will notice that the two equations are very similar to each other, but there are two key differences. First, the equation that models the membrane potential when the synaptic channels are open describes an exponential growth, whereas the equation that models the state when the synaptic channels are closed describes an exponential decay. Secondly, when the synaptic channels open, we need to take into account the resistance of the synaptic channels, and that is reflected in the value of the steady state voltage and the time constant. Whereas, when channels close, it is only the leak resistance that is to be taken into account. Because of this, the growth and decay will have different time constants, and thus different time courses. By the way, due to the fact that we add the inverse of the resistance, the total resistance will always decrease when we add a new resistance. Hence, 
The time constant when the synaptic channels are open will always be smaller than when the channels are closed. With this being said, let's now get into temporal summation and see how what we just derived helps us understand that aspect. To exemplify temporal summation, I want to give a numerical example of what a problem might look like because I believe that's more telling and better for our comprehensions. So, let's imagine that the membrane of this postsynaptic cell receives an excitatory connection that fires twice at 100 Hz. We want to figure out what will be the membrane potential at the end of the second pulse, and we will assume that the currents are constant. Here, we make this assumption to keep the steady state potential constant, as you will see later. We'll also imagine that based on the values of the resistance and capacitance of our postsynaptic neuron, the time constant during the synaptic activation is 1 millisecond, and when the channels close, the time constant becomes 3 milliseconds. Furthermore, we'll imagine that the current injection from the channels lasts 7 milliseconds and that the steady state potential is about 10 millivolts. To better visualize what's going on, let's also plot the membrane potential and the synaptic current as a function of time. Okay, so to solve this problem, I suggest to first understand when the synapse is active or not based on the frequency and the injection time. As a side note, the use of frequency to describe temporal dynamics in neurons happens very often. As a reminder, frequency, which is measured in hertz, corresponds to the inverse of the time interval between each pulse. In our problem, a frequency of 100 hertz means that the interval between each pulse is therefore 10 milliseconds. With this information, we can see that the first pulse lasts 7 milliseconds, and 3 milliseconds after its end, Another one is fired for 7 milliseconds again. In the plot of the membrane potential, we can also plot the steady state potential, which follows the same shape as the current. Now that the time frame is established, we can use our exponential equations to find the final membrane potential. From 0 to 7 milliseconds, plugging our numbers into the growth equation gives us that the membrane potential at 7 milliseconds will be plus 10 millivolts. In cases like this, where the time elapsed is significantly larger than the time constant, about 5 times tau, we can usually say that the membrane potential has reached the steady state potential. For that reason, the time constant is a good indicator to approximate where the membrane potential actually is in relation to the steady state. If, for example, the time constant was 30 milliseconds, well, we would have known that just by eyeballing the equation that the depolarization is far from the steady state. Moving on, we now need to compute by how much the signal decays in the 3 millisecond interval between the end of the first pulse and the start of the second. By plugging the numbers, we get that the signal decays to 3.7 millivolts. In cases like this, where t equals tau, there is another trick that can help you save some time. Indeed, when time and tau are equal, the exponential factor simply becomes e to the negative 1 or 1 minus e to the negative 1 which respectively gives 0.37 and 0.63. Hence, here I only had to multiply 10 by 0.37 instead of entering the exponential term in my calculator, which can be a bit tedious at times. Finally, we can add the membrane potential at the end of the second pulse by adding 10 millivolts to 3.7 to give a final answer of 13.7 millivolts. In a case like this, where the time constant and steady state potential stays the same for each pulse, there is no need to compute the depolarization again. We can just take what we found in the first step. I hope this problem wasn't too difficult to follow through. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments. To end our discussion on temporal summation, I want to briefly discuss the time constant. As we've seen in the problem, the time constant gives us a good estimate of where the decay and growth parts might end up. Now, if in this problem, the open and closed time constants were something small, let's say 0.1 millisecond and 0.3 milliseconds, you can see that the results are drastically different. Indeed, the time constants for the growth and the decay are so quick, relative to the current injection, that no summation can even occur. This means that to reach the threshold in these conditions, the presynaptic cell would need to fire at considerably higher frequencies, or inject very high depolarizing pulses. On the other hand, if in the problem the open and closed time constant were very large, let's say 10 and 30 milliseconds, there would be some summation, but the depolarizations only reach a fraction of the steady state potential. For that reason, there is a certain trade-off between low and large time constants.
If they are too small, then the potentials will rise quickly to the steady state, but it also means that the potentials will decay quickly and prevent summation. On the other hand, if the time constant is too large, it takes too much time for the postsynaptic potential to reach the steady state that it only reaches a certain fraction of it, but at least the slow decay increases the likelihood for consecutive signals to summit. Hence, we can say that as a rule of thumb, neurons that have longer time constants are more likely to summit in time because longer time constants cause longer decay times and thus more time for signals to summit. Alright, now let's move on to spatial summation, which occurs when two or more synaptic potentials are added in space. In temporal summation, we focused a lot on the time constant, and as you can imagine, here we will focus a lot on the space constant. Now, although they are two different measures, they can be interpreted in pretty much the same way. By the way, if ever you are unfamiliar with the space constant, I highly suggest you to watch this video on the cable theory model of the neuron, where I thoroughly explain how the constant can be derived and what it means. From the video, we covered that signals decay as a function of space, and that a high value of the space constant means it decays slower relative to a smaller value. Hence, if we imagine two different pulses that are activated at the same time, the likelihood that the two will be summed together will be much greater if the space constant is higher, since the signals will have decayed less. In summary, there are two main types of summation that we can consider, temporal and spatial. The main elements that can give us the most insight as to the signal summation are the time and space constants. In general, the bigger they are, the less the signals decay and the more probable it is they will summit. One thing to keep in mind here is that the two forms of summation always happen at the same time. It is only in our idealized theoretical worlds that the two can be analyzed separately, but in real neurons the synaptic connections get integrated in time and space simultaneously. Also, I looked at summation through the lens of excitatory connections but keep in mind that inhibitory connections also get summed and participate in the signals the neuron receives. Alright, back to our schematic on the differences between the neuromuscular junction and the central nervous system, we now have covered metabotropic receptors, the different neurotransmitters, and synaptic summation, which already gives us a pretty good idea on how neurons in the central nervous system are different from neurons in the neuromuscular junction. The final aspect that I want to cover now is a bit hidden under the lines of the differences shown here. As I mentioned multiple times, neurons in the central nervous system experience very weak inputs but in very large quantities, whereas the neuromuscular junction is essentially one large input on the muscle. This difference, as we've seen, leads to the concept of synaptic integration, but it also leads to the idea of plasticity. Basically, due to the fact that the inputs are so small in the central nervous system, it leaves room for them to be modulated, so to increase or decrease their strength, which is known as plasticity. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in our next discussion.